Greetings and welcome to this edition of How's the Trunk? I'm Barry P. Cook. I'm here to talk about the latest episode of Star Trek Picard. It was called Hide and Seek. And as it starts, it seems that Agnes wants to take over the ship. The one she was on earlier. Alone. And then left. I'm sorry, but I'm struggling to see how that makes any sense because why wouldn't she just have taken off with the ship and go into space, even if she wanted to hang around Earth for a while, for whatever reason. Like, Picard and the others would have had no way to get it back. I mean, am I missing something? Why did she need to leave the ship to go talk to Dr. Sung and then try to go back and take the ship? I don't understand. My question last episode was, okay, if she's trying to stop Picard for making sure that Renee has a successful mission, why didn't she just blow up the ship? Which would have prevented them from, you know, using the transporter or using the communication system or using any other resources on the ship that might have helped them complete the mission to protect Renee's mission as part of her plan to, you know, keep them from doing that. And I, I thought that because she disabled the transporter seemingly for that reason, and left the ship that she was doing it to go and assimilate people. And my other thought was, what about just blowing up the ship, which would also have the advantage of stopping Picard and company. And of course, the reason is that she wants the ship, but then why didn't she just take it? Like we know as of this episode that at some point, Agnes locked her out, you know, of the flight controls which she did presumably while not being able to stop her from locking the transporters. But she didn't even try to take off with the ship last episode, so I don't, I don't understand that. Anyway, now we're having a showdown over the ship, and she does try to take off, but she can't because Agnes locked the flight controls, and it turns out that she also created a combat hologram in Elnor's likeness, which I don't understand because if the ship didn't already have a combat hologram, it would have taken a lot of programming to make one. And I don't think she would have been able to do all of that in so short of time while fighting the queen's control. And even if she did, choosing Elnor as the avatar of it just seems weird at that point, even though I guess he's the fighter guy. So like, that makes sense, but all that knowledge would have to have been programmed in. And it's knowledge that she didn't have. So I don't understand. I mean, she says that the ship can create a hologram of anyone that's ever been on the ship. But like, are we supposed to get from that? That she just like pressed a couple of buttons and the ship's computer made a hologram of Elnor with all of his abilities as a fighter based on information it had about him? Like, is that really what we're supposed to think? I mean, okay, but why, why would it be limited to anyone who's ever been on the ship? Why not anyone in the Federation database, like the greatest fighter of all time? <laughs> like, it's just stupid. Anyway, that's where we are. And now they're fighting to save the ship, which is now under siege from the Queen and a whole bunch of her soldiers who immediately get on the ship, which again, wasn't locked or shielded or anything causing Rios and his friends to have to get off the ship. And weirdly, he doesn't ask the computer to engage the self-destruct, which, okay, they'd rather not give up the ship because they need it to get home, but like, he's a Starfleet captain. And he knows that he can't let the ship fall into the hands of a Borg queen. So just like they didn't let the Stargazer fall into her hands uh, in the premiere episode, why wouldn't, you know, and they sacrificed themselves to, to keep that from happening, which Rios was actually urging Picard to do at the time. Why wouldn't he have called for the self-destruct in this situation? The only thing I can think of, you know, that would have stopped him is that the woman and the uh, kid were there, but the three of them do get off the ship. So why wouldn't he just have called for the self-destruct and then get off the ship or at least get them off the ship? It makes no sense unless you figure out, okay, he was locked out of everything, but he wasn't locked out of comms and he wasn't locked out of the replicators. So like, wh why, not why not try it? He doesn't even try it. 
And then, you know, when Picard shows up, he immediately says, as the fight begins, we have to keep her from getting the ship, no matter the cost. So like, why between them do they not, like, does nobody have a communicator, which, you know, with which they could talk to the ship and at least ask it to engage the self-destruct? Like, they don't even try it. And, you know, I know they want to get home, but he says, no matter the cost, which he wouldn't even have had to say because we already know that they would sacrifice themselves from earlier in the season. And we know that it's protocol if it comes to it. But the fighting starts and Rios takes a shot. So Picard asks Talon to transport the woman and the kid and Rios to safety back at her office with her smoky, puffy, cloudy transporter thing that would have come in handy on previous occasions, but which they didn't use. Anyway, side note, when Rios gets to, the, to Talon's office with the doctor and the kid and tries to go back, he can't because Picard had Talon turn it off so that he couldn't come back, which I don't understand it because, wh why? Because he got shot in the arm with a conventional bullet? Like, what? <laughs> what? He's a military officer. Anyway, we get a flashback at that point to Picard as a kid where he's having a hide and seek type play day with his mother who apparently has been doing better mental health wise as of that time. And apparently it's the same day that we saw earlier in the show, but this time they're not having a conversation beforehand about how he's a prince and there's a monster or any of that. So I guess that was a false memory that he, that we saw when Talon was in his head. And now he's, you know, his real memory is coming back to him. Anyway, Dr. Sung then actually calls a ceasefire. He's, he's on site and he calls a ceasefire to ask Picard to surrender, which I keep saying this makes no sense because he wouldn't need to. He could just have pressed on and overwhelmed them with his overwhelming numbers. So why do that? Unless he thought there was a chance they could somehow, the four of them, keep the ship you know, from being taken, which I can't imagine why he would have thought that. Anyway, Picard says, you'll have to find us to kill us. And he gets the idea from his memory of playing hide and seek that he and Talon should basically play hide and seek or cat and mouse by heading into the chateau to try to make their way to the ship and while, you know, also evading the soldiers. But why doesn't Talon transport them to the ship? I mean, if it were shield blocked, then she wouldn't be able to, but they don't even try it. There's no indication that the shields are up. So I, don't get it. While in the Chateau Picard and has another memory of playing hide and seek with his mother and it would seem that during their game she went into one of her fugue states and entered the basement and told him to follow which his father has told him not to do he says not to go down there but she still urges him to do so saying that he's her light and that he always draws her out so he goes down there seeking for her, which we know he did from, from earlier episodes. Back in the present, Picard and Talon sort of retrace those steps from that memory, and, they end, and he ends up telling her the story of that occasion, but this time out loud, when she says she remembers seeing the place in his head. We then get a scene of Seven and Rafi, who of course always get paired up, and they're also in the chateau trying to get to the ship and there's a discussion about how Seven would have made a great captain and should have joined Starfleet which she explains only didn't happen because Starfleet wouldn't take her since she had the Borg implants and had been a Borg even though Janeway threatened to resign if they didn't take her which she didn't do. Meanwhile Rios is trying to rewire the subroutines on Talon's transporter which should be a completely foreign technology to him seeing as it belongs to the race of supervisors and doesn't seem to work in any way that's similar to Federation transporters or even Romulan transporters. And while he's doing that, the doctor tells him that he shouldn't do that because he's too injured to help even if he gets back because he has a simple bullet wound in his arm, which makes no sense. He's, he's a military officer. I mean, 
if your arm is damaged badly enough by a gunshot, okay, but he seems to be managing. So like he's a little wounded, I don't get it. And you know, and of course that's the same reason Picard didn't want him coming back. I, it doesn't make any sense. We see a little bit more of the time when Picard was playing hide and seek with his mother and we see where she urges him to forget everything he knew about how she was not right in the head, which might explain at least partly why he decided to actually suppress the memories. I, I, I thought in this moment, you know, that sort of lends itself to why maybe he suppressed everything, you know, because she asked him to. Back on the ship, Elnor continues to fight the Borg invaders and he's doing it with his sword, which is pretty cool. And Raffi and Seven make it aboard the ship, which apparently, again, the queen didn't bother to shield or lock, which means they could have used Talon's transporter to get in. I guess you could say, oh, the systems are locked so she couldn't put the shields up, but Agnes didn't say anything about everything being locked. She just said the flight controls were locked, so I don't know. But of course, Rafi sees the hologram and thinks it's Elnor, at which point he explains that he really isn't and that he's just a hologram, yet he knows that he hasn't seen her in a while, and then Seven gets him to give her access to the ship, despite the fact that it risks the queen being able to take off or do whatever. Raffi then confesses to Elnor, the, the hologram Elnor, that she manipulated his real self and feels guilty. And he says that he has Elnor's last memory before he died, which is one of love for her or whatever, and not blame. But how the flippity frack is that? possible at what point did Agnes manage to get his consciousness or his specific memories into the hologram like what he's not um, it's not you know they transferred Picard's consciousness into the android body but he hadn't quite died yet <laughs> and they had a particular set of tools available that she doesn't have on the ship, so how did she program his consciousness into the hologram, all while fighting the Borg Queen's control? Like, I don't, I just, it's just stupid. So Seven transport the soldier, transports the soldiers off the ship and into the walls of the chateau, which was pretty cool, actually, and then tries to transport Agnes to the brig, but it doesn't work because she has a transport inhibitor on her person, but didn't put any on the soldiers on the ship, apparently, because reasons. At that point, she engages in hand-to-hand -hand combat with Elnor, but doesn't use her voice to try to access the ship controls to turn him off. Now that the controls are open, which she knows because she just saw them try to use the transporters. She also doesn't put the shields up or anything. Then Elnor beats her in hand-to-hand -hand combat and gets her down, at which point they hold her at phaser point and sword point, which of course would be completely absurd because she could adapt, but at this point, she finally uses her voice to take control of the ship, which was entirely predictable, which is why it was insane for Seven to take the risk that they'd be able to contain her before she did exactly that, which begs the question, why as soon as she realized that, they, uh, that as soon as they realized she had a transport inhibitor, doesn't Elnor relock the computer instantaneously? Like, it's all MacGuffins. Anyway, she's back in control, and she instantly tells the computer to set a course for the Delta Quadrant, which I guess has nothing to do with assimilating Earth, because the plan now, apparently, is to get to her people and prepare to fight against the coming Confederation. Before doing this, she seriously wounds Seven, but then can't seem to actually kill her because Agnes fights her, and explains to her that no matter what future comes, the Borg are always doomed, and that the two of them are the same, both lonely seeking connection. And she quite movingly talks the Borg Queen into becoming a kinder, gentler Borg, which I have to say is pretty Star Trek and which explains why she is in fact seeking peace in the first episode of this season. We then rejoin Rios and it seems he's managed to fix the specialists or the supervisor's transporter and is heading back to the fight, at which point the doctor asks him to stay, to which he says he can't because it's not his time, which 
goes against what a lot of fans have been thinking, which was that he was going to stay, which I knew wasn't going to happen. But he does say, you know, he was tempted to, but he can't. He then beams himself right to the chateau and right to the room where Picard is, which I'm not sure how he managed to know that that's where he had to go, but he does. And he rescues Picard and Talon by fighting off the Borg and causing Dr. Sung to unintentionally explode a phaser by holding it too long without having the proper DNA to operate it because apparently phasers are DNA coded, which I don't think makes sense unless every time an officer grabs a phaser from an armory, it encodes their DNA. Okay. Why didn't it encode to Sung's? Because there was already a DNA code in it, I guess. I don't know. But he tosses it in the air as it explodes and gets away. We then see a memory of what happened when Picard let his mother out of the room, which is that she hung herself. And he explains that it's a memory that he suppressed all of his life because he blamed himself for it. And to the writer's credit, thank goodness, they worked in dialogue that explains how it is that he saw like visions of her or manifestations of her later in life as an older woman which is because he, you know, built that into his suppression of the memory where he, you know, he imagined her having led an, a full life. So I thought that was good because now we understand why he sees her as an old lady in, early episode, in an early episode of TNG. And they so frequently don't explain these things, but this they finally did. And it, it, it makes sense, which is cool. We then see a flashback of Picard throwing a rock at the glass in the greenhouse room at the Chateau, which is what caused it to break. And that moment is intercut with Picard having a moment with Talon as he adjusts to having re, you know, integrated these memories. Back on the ship, we see that Agnes has saved Seven from dying after having attacked her by making her like she was before with her Borg implants. And then we see her transport Seven and Raffi off the ship and take off with it because that was the deal that she would save Seven and get the ship so that she could go and change the Borg. And, you know, as this is the current, she says everything's going to be fine. They don't have to worry about the Borg, but they do have to still stop Brent Spiner from sabotaging the mission, which they head off to do after Seven gives Picard a message from the Queen, which was that there need to be two Rene Picards, one who lives and one who dies, which I don't quite understand, but which I guess will be sussed out in episode 10. Of course, now we know that the masked Borg Queen that we saw in the first episode is Agnes, which people have been thinking for a while now after a lot of folks initially thought that it was going to be his mother. I had recently been saying that it was just going to be the same old Borg Queen, that it wasn't going to be any other character, because my thinking was that, you know, she and Agnes would end up somehow getting separated, that she would get back into her body. And that, you know, through everything, she was gonna realize that she needed to make allies of the Federation rather than enemies, sort of on her own. And it looks like both myself and the people who were thinking that it was gonna be Agnes were correct because she is both the same old queen and Agnes. And she did come to that realization with prompting from Agnes and while also being intertwined with Agnes's consciousness. So again, I think it's pretty cool. And I think that not only did the speech which changed the queen's mind give Agnes gravitas and depth, but the fact that she's now this new character that's a combination of the two of them and that she does actually go on to broker a peace with the Federation gives the character a lot of depth and strength that it hadn't had all up all the way up to this point because it looks like we're not going to ever see Agnes as her own person again, which up to this point, I thought we might end up seeing that, you know, that they might end up getting separated again, but that's not going to happen. It went where it went, but both folks who thought the queen was going to be Agnes and myself, we thought, no, it's just going to be the same old queen having changed, had a change of heart. We're, we're both right. And that's pretty cool. So, I actually like this episode, despite some of the goofy stuff that doesn't make sense, because I think the whole concept of the Borg seeking peace and seeking to change 
that we were introduced to in the first episode of the season was actually a pretty cool idea. You know, on the level of the eventual peace between the Federation and the Klingons. And in this episode, we were able to see the genesis of that. And I think the thinking behind it that drove them to that change made a lot of sense. It was actually an inspired idea on behalf of the writers and, you know, within the universe on behalf of Agnes. And I think, as I said, it gives the character some gravitas that up to now it just hadn't had. I think the speech that she gave was actually pretty cool and very Star Trek and reminiscent of, you know, other speeches and ideas that have come up in Star Trek before, specifically when Kirk urges the Mirror Universe Spock to make changes in, you know, that universe and the sort of conversations in Star Trek VI where Kirk and the Chancellor sort of come to a meeting of the minds about how things need to change. And we've seen this kind of thing happen on other shows. So I'm down with it and I liked it. And I also liked where, you know, where they went with the story of Picard and his mother, because it adds a layer to the character. It adds a whole aspect to his personality that we can now look back and say, wow, he was, you know, struggling with that all of his life. And I think it beefs up the character, which, you know, would have been true whether he suppressed the memories or not, because, you know, just by itself, what a profound thing to have gone through, right? Your mother was mentally ill and you experienced that as a child and then witnessed her having hung herself and then blamed yourself. And, you know, on top of that, he also suppressed it, which is a whole other thing. But, you know, I thought it was a powerful reveal. And I think it's cool that that's now something that's part of his character. A lot of the complaints about this show from myself and others have been that, you know, they ruined the character and the character just wasn't, was kind of like a pale, you know, ghost of the character. But this, I think, really does something positive for the character. I think it was a good thing. And some people are going to harp on it and say, oh, of course it was about personal trauma. And, but, you know, Star Trek has been about that a lot. They just went overboard lately on Star Trek with this whole personal trauma thing that everybody seems to have. But Star Trek is, like I said in my last review, I think, has often done stories about how people overcome their personal traumas. And that's always been a strength of Star Trek. So I think they did that again here. And I think the way it turned out forgives a few of the sort of complaints that I and others had in the beginning where it seemed out of the blue that he had this trauma in his his past and you know it seemed out of the blue that his mother had been mentally ill during his childhood but I think they made it make sense and I think they made it make sense in a powerful way so I was happy to see that of course there are still a lot of other problems with the show I mean and the, there are a lot of stuff just in the beginning of this episode that once again don't make any sense and you know we're going into the final week and we're still left wondering how are they going to bring Q back into the story? What's that about? How are they going to resolve that? What are they going to do with not Soji? <laughs> like, well, how's all that going to go? But I guess we'll see. I'll be back with a review of the finale after it's released. Until then, I take my leave and I wish you peace and long life.